Today we're going to run through the, the long-term causes of the First World War, and we're going to start um, by, by um, trying to memorize this, this acronym that historians and history teachers have long used to help students keep in, in order or, or keep track of the major long-term causes. Uh, but I, as, as IB students, I want you guys to really focus on the idea that all of these are at play at the exact same time. They all have an impact to play on the origins of the First World War. One thing that the IB exam uh, might ask you to do for a war or multiple wars in the 20th century is to address to what extent nationalism or, or um, imperialism or whatever factors uh, contributed to the start of, of 20th century wars. Um, so you want to be familiar with all four of these, but we also want to take an evaluative stand as we go through um, this, this study. We want to be able to maybe argue that that one has a bigger role to play than the other. Uh, keep in mind what, what I've always said in class. It doesn't matter what um, your answer is. Um, you can get equally high marks for saying it is militarism more so than nationalism, um, but you have to be able to support your arguments. Why is something a bigger factor than something else? So today we're just gonna run through what these factors are. And as we work through the year, you're gonna be able to decide for yourself what kind of stand that you would take. So we are, we're not gonna go through these in the order that they are in this acronym, uh, in this mnemonic device to help us remember them. We're gonna mix them up a little bit. Now I wanna start with, with imperial rivalries. Uh, 19th century imperialism is an important theme in world history. Basically these Western European countries countries, primarily Britain and France and Germany, um, gobbling up colonies uh, around the world. Uh, there's a number of reasons why these countries were expanding their territories um, with regard to economic factors. They're coming uh, through the Industrial Revolution, so there is a need for resources uh, and raw materials for industrial production. There's also a need for um, markets to sell their finished goods to. Um, there is, in addition, a push for, for countries to feel self-sufficient, that they don't have to rely on anybody else for their resources, because at any time, any country can cut somebody off. That's what we call protectionism. There are also political and military factors uh, to, to creating overseas empires. These, these empires created an extension of, of rivalries that already existed in Europe. So a rivalry between Britain and Germany or France and Germany in Europe can, can extend overseas. That's a, that's a place where these nations might gain a leg up on their adversaries. Uh, colonies also provide strategic military locations uh, for, for refueling ships, for example. Remember, this is the era of the steamship. So ships heading across the Pacific Ocean or, or across from the Atlantic Ocean to the, the Indian Ocean or even through the Suez Canal and the Mediterranean uh, to the Red Sea, they've got to refuel at some point. So having colonies located at strategic points can, can aid that, those naval operations. And finally, colonies are going to provide increased manpower for their armies. Um, if you have a colonial empire, you've got a, a larger well of soldiers that you can lean on. And certainly, all of the belligerents in World War I that have overseas colonies are going to be using those colonial subjects as soldiers um, and, and to supply labor in the war. This is also an aspect of nationalism. Empires bring pride into the nation. Remember the, uh, the British saying that the sun never sets on the British empire. Uh, the Germans, uh, a newer country on the scene, are, are going to claim that, that, that they desire their place in the sun. So having overseas empires can lead to a nation feeling more nationalistic pride. And if we take a look at the map here, you can see that, that much of Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia was colonized by these Western European countries. And we see a little more green than any other country uh, or than any other color on that map. That is the empire of Great Britain, um, who, um, who is um, the, the largest empire in the world at the start of the 20th century. As it comes to these empires, we want to focus on, on at least one specific incident that, that raises the tensions between uh, Western European powers, and that is going to be the crises that center on the, the, uh, the region of Morocco in North Africa. This was a place that was claimed by France. You can see the strategic location of, of Morocco and, and North Africa, uh, just south of Spain, uh, at the Straits of Gibraltar. So whoever controls that territory in controls or 
or has at least in part control of a, one of the most important waterways in the world. Uh, France wanted this as a part of their North African colonies. And an agreement between France and Britain in 1904 allowed France to control Morocco. But Germany, rising in power in Western Europe at the time, was not down with that. And so in 1905, Germany is going to be, be pushing for, for the Moroccans themselves to, to clamor for independence. This is that idea of nationalism we'll talk about in a moment, that a people should have the right to rule themselves. And so the French are going to be bent out of shape that the Germans are trying to convince these French colonists uh, to, to rise up against the French. And so we've got, we've got a beef. Ultimately, France comes out of this as the recognized controller of, of the uh, Moroccan territory, but it raises the tensions between uh, Germany and France. This is going to continue a few years later. This is going to continue a few years later in 1911 when the Germans continue to advocate for uh, the independence of, the, of Morocco and a Moroccan popular uprising. Once again, France sees this as a threat and the tensions rise. Um, ultimately, obviously no, no war is going to come between these two nations, but each side prepared for war. So we can see that this push for overseas empires is creating greater tensions between European countries that already had tensions with each other. I want to talk for a moment about nationalism as a major contributor to the, the push for World War I. Nationalism is this ideology that is born uh, in the 19th century and, and it spreads and it catches on. I like in my class to talk about two different kinds of nationalism. There is that nationalism of the country that uh, already exists, like the British people and the French people and the German people and Americans. They already have their countries and they're proud of their countries and they want their countries to exert uh, more strength and power around the globe. But then there's also those people that don't have a nation of their own. Maybe they're part of the Ottoman Empire or they're living within one of those other great powers, empires, and they might want to, uh, to exert their own independence and their own rights to what we call self-determination, to determine for themselves how they want to be, to be ruled. Uh, we are going to see this especially strong in the Balkan Peninsula, that is in Southeast uh, Europe. Um, we're going to see that especially strong there in parts that are either controlled by, by the Ottoman Empire or Austria-Hungary. Uh, we are going to see Germans pushing ideas of German superiority, uh, Russians supporting notions of pan-Slavism, that all Slavic people should be standing together in, in some kind of nationalistic pride. Uh, the French are, are demanding, standing together in solidarity to, to demand for territory like Alsace and Lorraine to come back to them uh, because they feel that the Germans uh, maybe illegally took it from them after the uh, Franco-Prussian War. So this notion of nationalism is going to drive a lot of these conflicts in, in Western Europe and, and in Central Europe. Um, war is, deter is seen as a method to demonstrate national power. Um, and so if you are nationalistically proud of your country, you might be able to use a war to demonstrate that you can put your money where your mouth is. And also the notion of social Darwinism. This is an idea that was born in the late 19th century um, on, on an individual level. It, it was used to justify why some people might find success in life and why other people might lag behind, but pushed to a national level, social Darwinism would explain, at least for the British and the Germans, why, why their countries have a right to, to dominate uh, other nations of the world and other peoples of the world. Um, with regard to militarism, uh, militarism is, is, is putting a nation's focus behind its military. And this is deeply connected with the idea of nationalism as well. A state's value is seen in the strength of its military. And we're going to see in the years before 1914, the great powers of Europe dramatically expanding the size and the scope of their military. We're going to see military values in society be seen as desirable. And that's why, for example, uh, if we look at um, an organization like the Boy Scouts that was born in, in England but would spread to other nations, um, this is pushing martial values or military values on the younger boys in society who would one day grow up and, and be soldiers. And, and if you 
you know anything about the Boy Scouts, you might know that their motto is to be prepared. Uh, but their full motto um, is, is pushing these young men to be prepared to fight and die for their country. Uh, pretty intense by, by 21st century standards, but certainly it was the message that was being pushed uh, prior to World War I. Um, military service in many nations was becoming compulsory. It means you had to serve. And so armies are going to grow farther or go, grow larger and larger. And this could really only be done because these countries have gone through the Industrial Revolution. And so you can produce the, the boots and the uniforms and the weapons that, that these massive armies are going to need. Um, we are also going to see new technologies that increase uh, uh, the, the devastation that a future war could bring. Uh, this is all connected to, to a, a, an arms race in the early 20th century. As countries develop better uh, communications um, technologies, uh, telegraphs and, and uh, such, and, and better transportation, um, increased industrial capacities. Um, countries literally in their factories can now mass produce the weapons of war. Uh, improved weapons of war. We're going to see new things like submarines and, and airplanes, new battleships. This is a dreadnought battleship. It's a, it's a new battleship uh, deployed by the British Navy, and then the German Navy would follow suit with, with a similar one. Um, more accurate rifles and artillery. Uh, self-loading machine guns, um, just tremendous advancements in the weapons of war and nations were spending huge amounts of money in order to produce those weapons and create uh, more powerful militaries. With those militaries, nations would, would plan for the future war um, long before that war would ever come to be. And I want to highlight a couple of these war plans and, and just because you have war plans doesn't mean you're going to war, but it does give you an option should your, your country get to that point where they decide a war is inevitable. Um, Germany uh, in the early 1900s, 1905, developed their first version of the Schlieffen Plan, uh, which was a plan to attack France uh, through neutral Belgium um, and, and lead to a, a quick defeat of, of France before they might be challenged in the uh, east by Russia. France themselves had their own military war plan called Plan 17, which called for a more frontal assault into Germany, uh, into the region of Alsace and Lorraine to regain those territories. Finally, I want to run through a series of alliances. You do not need to memorize the years of these alliances. I just want you to recognize that they exist. And for, for decades before World War I, the alliance system was born and would grow. Um, first in 1879, we've got an alliance between Germany and Austria-Hungary called the Dual Alliance. Uh, those countries share a lot of cultural traits with each other, but also the notion um, that, that Germany and Austria-Hungary in Central Europe might find themselves uh, kind of divided, surrounded, or as, as we would see uh, used in your reading, encircled by France and Britain. Uh, that dual alliance would grow a few years later to the Triple Alliance as Italy would, would come into a defensive alliance with Germany, Austria, and, and um and now Italy. Uh, please recognize these are defensive alliances. This doesn't mean that, that if one country attacks someone else, they've all got to attack. This means if one country is attacked, they would all have to defend themselves or they would all defend each other. That's gonna be important to our story of, of the summer of 1914. Um, the dual entente in 1894, that word entente is a French word for agreement, basically. Um, and so we've got an, an agreement between the French and the Russians. And obviously you can see this, this agreement bookends uh, the, the Austrian-Hungary and German empire uh, alliance that we see in Central Europe. Later, the British and the, uh, the Russians would sign their own entente um, along with the British and the French. These agreements would eventually turn into the triple entente by the time we get to World War I, when all three ultimately agree to, to fight against the Germans. So, so there you have it, militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. We'll talk in a little bit about some of the, uh, the historiography of this, this time period and, and what ideas some historians are going to argue about which is more important than others. But you just make sure you're able to speak on all four of those and you yourself can make a decision on which ones might pull a little bit more weight. See you next time.